Thank you, Christine and Sherelle. And um, it looks like Ron Proctor's all ready to go. Hello, I'm the Proctor. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, brilliant. I was having uh, some audio trouble, so I uh, had to get the screwdriver out and fix that. Um, <laughs> but I've run out of orange juice, so. <laughs> all right. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, free open source software. And let's get the old screen shared here. And when I'm talking about FOSS, that, that means free open source software, and I might use that term loosely. Well, well, not that loosely, but uh, that's just what that means. And I'm trying to find my, how do I make this actually be a presentation? Let's see, it's like I'm a teacher. Oh, there we go. Okay, all right. So free open source software uh, is all about freedom and community. And I'm gonna make the case for that here in just a minute. Uh, but first I wanna talk about the community aspect, actually. I stand on the shoulders of giants. And there are quite a few, but uh, let me just show you a few of them real quick. First one is Waylena McCulley. Waylena is uh, an absolute pioneer in free open source software education and has been an awesome, awesome uh, resource for me over the years and is just kind of a leader in in adoption and advocacy for open source in full dome and she's also the only first name googleable person i know you should try that um, and she's the author of the foss dome blog fossdome.blogspot.com so check that out also i'd like to acknowledge aaron McEwen, also known as dr star aaron is a uh Full Dome animation pioneer. Uh, you may recall uh, Secret of the Cardboard Rocket. That's, that was his show. And uh, he's an education and public outreach innovator. Uh, you know, when, when he doesn't have a dome, he make, makes his own dome and takes it around, or at least buys it. He's also a VR influencer, and he's been uh, doing a lot of VR work in classrooms, and that has just been really awesome to see all the amazing stuff that Aaron has been doing. Also, check out uh, his Icy Stars Astronomy Club in VR Space on Tuesdays at 1.30 Mountain Time. Also, I'd like to acknowledge Michelle Wistison. She is uh, a, an educator and fellow Vygotskyist. If you, those of you who are in education, you'll know uh, the work of Lev Vygotsky. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of, uh, of Lev's work in like uh, uh, educational uh, theory, uh, zone of proximal development, things like that. Um, she's also a, has, has been a really great mentor for me over the years and an inspiration really in the way that she's worked with her students. She's brought in people to also work with her students at the planetarium. Uh, I think she's been an outstanding leader for Casper Planetarium, for Rampa, and also for this year conference. So uh, just keeping up with the family, I know that a lot of you guys know uh, Amy Joe, and you'll also know Rigel if you have, uh, if you have the show that he's in. Uh, when he was a lot younger, he was in uh, uh, a show called This Is Our Sky. And uh, we also have Antonin Sirius. And these guys are in charge of uh, taking care of our flock of chickens. And uh, we've all been sorted. Uh, Tony and I are, are both in Slytherin because we're evil geniuses. Also, uh, Physics Foundry, our, our little side project is still a thing. Um, uh, but this is not really a vendor presentation, so we'll not make it too vendory. And to catch up with me, I'm teaching ninth grade computer science and related subjects at what I call one of the toughest schools in the region. And I use that term in the positive way, uh, which I'll explain just in a minute. But I, you know, honestly, I started this job in January and I was not planning for it to be a real long-term thing. I thought I'd stick around for maybe a year or so. But uh, what I've found is that the school I work at is tough in the, like in the physical sense. It's strong. It can, and, and the students that are there can withstand tough stuff. And they, a lot of them are going through some pretty hard stuff in their lives. And it's been my pride and joy uh, to, to make what little difference I can in those lives. And I fell in love with the job just a few weeks in. 
because of the power of the community. There's effective leadership there. I feel welcome, safe, and supported. I feel recognized. I feel trusted and empowered. And, and my interaction with the community at my workplace has just been awesome. Uh, I feel like I'm making a difference, and my community is also making a difference in me. I've picked up a number of new uh, mentors there, and it's just been a, a really uh, wonderful situation. And those of you who know me really personally, you'll know that uh, I could have uh, done with a little bit of healing in my life, and, and I can say that this job has been a healing environment for me. Also, as Windows, and if you've ever been in Clark Planetariums, uh, uh, actually, every office I've had in the planetarium world never had windows. And I have windows I can look out, which is, which is pretty great. And the neighbors have chickens. Uh, I don't know how that got in there. OK, that's not what I came here to talk about. We're talking about free open source software, free, which in the sense of gratis and libre, free as in doesn't cost you anything to get it, kind of. And Libre, meaning it's freedom. It is something that you can take the source from. That's the open source part, is uh, you can get the source. If you have the programming chops, you can actually contribute to the programs, uh, to the projects, to the community. And it's just a, a real beautiful uh, synergy that happens. And I would say if you've written off free software in the past, it's really time to take another look at it. Uh, the community has reached new levels of maturity and organization, and some of the projects have, have reached a very competitive level with the commercial softwares. And, and I'm just going to bring you a callback to, to a slide a few moments ago where I fell in love with the job because of these reasons, but I also fell in love with FOSS because of these reasons. Uh, the open source community is is has grown immensely and this this right here is what i would say is kind of the the promise of the internet uh you know back in the 90s when we talked about mass collaborations and stuff like that over time and space uh the internet has delivered and we are now at a, at a point where we're seeing uh extremely high quality software coming from communities of collaboration and because of the effective leadership in those communities, we're seeing, we're seeing some, of those, some of those projects really take off. Blender is, is one great example of that. Like I say, leadership matters. And I think that uh, we can all agree <laughs> to some degree or another uh, as, uh, as, you know, in your workplace community, but also in, our, in your state, local, and even national communities, I think the concept of leadership mattering is a, is a big deal. And it matters in FOSS as well. What I've found is that uh, as, as we've relied on commercial software, especially the Adobe suite in my case, um, it's in recent years has become kind of disappointing. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm seeing symptoms of design by committee happening. I'm seeing symptoms of, oh, just slap another number on it switch up the interface, don't really add new features, don't really fix some bugs. And it's just not advancing in the way that some of the free open source softwares have been advancing in recent years. Uh, free open source software is designed by community. And, and let me show you what I mean by that. Um, the Blender Open Movies, are a collection of animation short films that the Blender Foundation uh, kind of underwrites. And the way that they pay for this is they get grants and donations. They'll pre-sell the DVDs and stuff like that. Uh, there's also now, uh, in more recent years, there's a Blender Development Fund where, where companies like mine uh, can donate you know, a few tens of dollars a month so that the foundation has money they can count on receiving. And uh, I encourage you to look at all of these, but, but my very favorite one right now is probably Spring. That's not, uh, also Coffee Run is great, um, but Spring is probably my very favorite right now. Also here, oh my gosh, I, I love them all. But check these out because, and the reason these are important is that the foundation, the Blender Foundation goes out, they come up with a show idea and they hire artists to work on it. They hire programmers to work on it. They raise money to pay for it all. Everyone gets paid that's working on the project. 
Um, I, I guess minus a few volunteers here and there, but for the most part, the people that are making the movie are getting paid. The people who are developing the software get paid. And the job of the artist is to say, make this software do stuff that I want that it doesn't do yet. Make it do new stuff. And the job of the programmers is to make it do that stuff. And that's why Blender is, a, in my opinion, a shining example of, of software that's community-driven design. And it's, uh, it, it, I think it just shows in the product. It has, uh, when I started using Blender, it was, uh, it was a, uh, actually Elephant's Dream, I think, had just come out around version 2.42. We're now past version 2.8 or I think 2.83 or something like that. 2.91 is in alpha. And the feature set growth from, from where I started over a decade ago to where it is now is just bonkers. Also, it's way more usable than ever before. And also way more teachable than ever before, just in the last couple of years. So I already knew and loved Blender. Uh, I was still relying on the Adobe Suite for everything else. And what I've decided to do over the last few months is assemble uh, a free open source software production suite. Not so much for financial reasons, like Physics Foundry was until just this month, Physics Foundry was paying uh, Adobe uh, about 50 bucks a month to have the Adobe suite because it's what I knew. I liked it well enough. And, but as I, as I show in this slide, uh, we had some growing dissatisfaction of the products. There was some, some usability stuff. That it actually was starting to get less usable over time. And I don't think I'm getting dumber over time. I, well, maybe I am. But uh, uh, because it was getting less usable over time, it was getting, uh, and it was not getting more complex in the right ways, uh, Amy Jo and I decided to drop it. But more importantly, uh, I, I'm interested in open source software in a full production suite of it for the sake of my students. Uh, I work in a school that has about, it has over 700 students and most of them are on, or most of them qualify for a free and reduced lunch. And if you're a teacher, what that means is that uh, your student population is facing some serious socioeconomic challenges. Most of my students don't have a big computer at home. They, they might have a phone and maybe a Chromebook. Um, the school provides Chromebooks and that's kind of my next hurdle, but uh, how do I, uh, how do I, how do I teach a student this commercial software that they have that they're going to leave and have a hard time actually affording? Uh, that that just doesn't comport for me. So, uh, what I want to do is provide a suite of software tools that my students can use to express themselves, to represent themselves better, and that they don't have to pay for, at least not up front. Once you know, once a once a student or a studio becomes successful. Uh, there is a drive to give back, and, uh, and that's something that we do. Uh, but I want them to have something they can get into for free. I want it to be powerful, and that's what I want to teach. So uh, just an overview of this software suite kind of collection of titles that I'm talking about here. We've got Blender, uh, and you guys probably all know me as, as a Blender guy. Uh, Waylena which is why I mentioned her at the top. Waylena is, uh, is, has been a Blender person way longer than me. Uh, and, and she is someone who Amy Jo and I would look up to for uh, help as we were getting into Blender for planetarium production. And uh, just a few main points about Blender. It does 3D modeling and animation. It, uh, in my case, it replaces uh, all the 3D softwares. It's the only 3D software that I use. And it also replaces compositing softwares, uh, such as uh, After Effects, Nuke. Uh, and also I've used it, I, I use it in virtually every planetarium show as the video sequence editor for the show, because it handles, uh, it handles frame-wise footage really well. Uh, even, even at really high resolutions. Uh, I can stick a high resolution JPEG proxy in there and it just chews it right up. It's, it, it shows it a good frame rate and everything. The performance is really good in frame-based editing. It also does a native fisheye and equirectangular rendering with AI-driven smoothing, which is a real important thing that lets you get your render times down. You can render with less samples and it still comes out looking nice with that AI smoothing. 
there's also a physics simulation, all the kinds of physics simulations you'd want. Uh, Node-based compositing, as I mentioned. And let's move on to some more. For my regular workaday video editor, like when I'm making stuff for the Mr. Proctor show, which is my bonkers YouTube video channel that I do for fun, <laughs> um, uh, I've, been, I've been using Kaden Live. And Kaden Live is a uh, free open source video editing solution. Uh, does a great job with effects, does a great job with uh, the videos that are coming out of my phone and out of my GoPro. Check it out at kdenlive.org. Krita is my replacement for Photoshop. Now, I know there's a lot of GIMP fans out there, but for whatever reason, I've tried GIMP, I've tried to get the hang of it, and I just haven't been able to get the hang of it yet. Uh, 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 but I, I looked around for alternatives, and I found Krita, and Krita is a more recently, uh, has, has a more recent birth than, uh, than Photoshop, and I, I just like the interface a little bit better. Uh, right out of the box, it does multi-layer uh, raster graphics creation and editing. Uh, non-destructive effects, vector graphics features, all the stuff that I needed in Photoshop but wasn't necessarily getting uh, from GIMP, at least not in a way that was working for me. However, uh, I do mention GIMP. GIMP is, is, uh, has a lot of, of uh, community support and uh, it's also worth looking into. And uh, Waylina can actually uh, probably get you up to speed on GIMP way faster than I can. So maybe that's the thing that she and I will fight over. Inkscape. Uh, Inkscape is a vector graphics creation and editing software. It specializes in SVG formats, which is a open XML-based format. And what that means is that the, the stuff that it makes is widely compatible. So if I need a, like a tool path in some other software for 3D printing or some CNC work, I can do that in Inkscape, and there's a pretty good chance I can translate that to whatever I need in, in whatever control software I need to use. Uh, it also supports PDF, and you can check that out at inkscape.org. Audacity, and I've used Audacity for quite a while uh, on and off, and uh, I used to kind of not like it because it was not very stable, but more recently it's, it's quite stable and very feature rich. Um, I do that, I do effects processing, I do spectral analysis with that on audio files, uh, especially for like if I, in my case, I'm usually doing noise reduction, um, uh, but uh, audacityteam.org is where you'll find that software. And I've also been kind of messing around with some music composition stuff. Um, as you know, or as some of you know, if you've been following me on, on the YouTubes or on the Facey space, um, I've got a, a, a modular synthesizer that I, that I bought a little while ago. And if you want to try that kind of technology, that kind of workflow, but you don't want to buy the hardware, check out VCV Rack, and you have this, this modular synthesizer workstation that's kind of virtual. You can put modules in and plug them in different ways and, and just kind of act like this audio mad scientist uh, making amazing sounds or horrible sounds. Uh, is the case is often is for me. Um, also, LLM LMMS is a music composition and sequencing software. I do lots of loops and beats composition, or at least I'm trying to with that. It's in that's at LMMSIO. VCV Rack is at vcvrack.com. Also, one more note on VCV Rack it's, it is free and open source. Um, but they've also set up this community of, of support where uh, you can, you can write different modules for it, and you can either charge for those modules or not. And, and I think that's pretty cool. That's, that's giving independent programmers an opportunity to contribute and also be rewarded for their work. And so I'm, I'm into that. But the main point here is that FOSS benefits from community support and effective leadership. And uh, the leadership component is, is something that I've really come to respect and expect uh, in my workplace and also in the communities that I'm working in. Uh, without effective leadership, it's, uh, it's a spaghetti bowl of, of ideas and you don't get solid direction. Um, I think the very best example of effective leadership in the, in the open source community is Blender. I think the Blender Foundation 
Uh, I've watched them develop over the last several years, and I think they're doing an awesome job driving the software forward, engaging the community, raising money to pay their people. In fact, they, uh, they actually moved their offices. They're in, uh, uh, they're in, ah, I'm blanking on the name, uh, Amsterdam. And they just moved their offices kind of from the outskirts to a more uh, central location in Amsterdam because they are going gangbusters. Uh, and I'm just really proud to be part of that, even though my part is not as a programmer, I'm just a user that kicks in a few bucks every month. Um, but that few bucks a month is optional and you can get into it for free. Um, but for me, FOSS is about empowering my students to express themselves. And uh, I think of my position as a teacher as like, it's, it's a special role in the community I live in. And teachers have a special, uh, a special trust in the communities they live in. They have special responsibilities in the communities they live in. And if, if I wanna do a good job as a teacher in my community, I think I need to be empowering my students to express themselves better, more powerfully. And I wanna give them the tools to do that. And I want them to be able to hit the ground running without having to buy a bunch of stuff, um, aside from maybe a computer or something. Uh, so for me, FOSS is about empowering my students and helping them express themselves, helping them engage in the community, helping them get their ideas out there, and also helping them gain better representation for their needs and for their family's needs. So that is all I have prepared. So uh, I'm ready to take some questions and kick some answers out. Bring it. Don't everybody jump up at once. Ron, how are you? Hey. Hey. Okay, so are some of these are new. I hadn't heard of some of these. Are they cross-platform like Blender and Audacity are? Yes, I believe that uh, I believe that all of them I've mentioned should be cross-platform with uh, Linux, Windows, and Mac. Okay. And I think that's one of my main gripes with GIMP is that I had a lot of trouble getting that to be happy on a Mac. And I think that's kind of what, what discouraged my early uh, use of it. I'm, I'm on a Windows machine now, but I think, I think I'm gonna be switching to Linux as my main operating system soon. I still use Linux mostly, although I do now have a Windows machine because I wanna be able to make full use of Worldwide Telescope. And that is one of those projects that is never going to be um, fully available for uh, window or sorry for Linux uh, or Mac. And Ron, I'm not going to fight you about Krita. It's 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 <laughs> great. Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah. And both Krita and uh, GIMP can make use of the GMIC filters. They're it's just an incredible set of add-ons for it. It's it's beautiful. This is a great time to get into open source. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. It's, uh, like I said, the, the organization, the leadership, and the community support has just never been better. Uh, the usability has never been better, especially in like a really nasty, scary software like Blender. Uh, in fact, just a story about that. I, I had a, a student, um, uh, I'll just give you the first name. His name is Matai. And he wanted, to, he wanted to design something for 3D printing. And I said, okay, well, we're gonna, we're gonna design that in Blender. And I, kind of as an experiment, I just said, okay, here's the software, here's, a, here's just the basics, here's how to start. And I wanted to see how he did. And that dude made the, a very complicated 3D shape uh, that it would have taken Waylena or I probably a couple of days of instruction in a workshop to get someone to make in older versions of Blender. But now it's so much easier to use, so much more intuitive that this ninth grader was a, with no experience, jumped in and actually made stuff. Uh, that's the kind of, of massive leap that I'm talking about. Got about four or five minutes left. Hi, Ron. This is John Armstrong. Good to see I you. I love that logo, John. Hey, it looks <laughs> good, doesn't it? Um, so one of the things, I mean, I, I jumped into Blender a while ago and I, like you, uh, found it really difficult to use. And then I 
use the new one and it is so much easier. But honestly, the process of the creative process of linking all these things together is the thing that I find the most difficult to manage both for myself and for my students. Like you can say, okay, here are all these tools, um, but it, it would be great to see um, kind of, and there's lots of YouTubes about how to do specific things in the tools, but in terms of like, you know, how do you create a show from start to finish? How do you create, you know, a podcast from start to finish? You know, those types of production level things um, using the open source software would be really, really useful. And I think if you had some instruction on that, um, I'm sure that would, I'm sure you're doing that for your students already, but that, that whole kind of end to end, you know, when you worked for, for us, you give us aw these awesome workflows, which were really helpful to figure out how to get from A to B. Um, but doing that with the open source software would be amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And just talking about the process in general terms, uh, I kind of liken it to building a house uh, where you dig the foundation and that's like your show idea. You pour the foundation and that's your script. And, and you start laying down the basic framework, that's the audio. And I, th I, think, uh, 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 I, think, I, I think I'm quoting Mark Peterson when I say that the show needs to be, it needs to be satisfying just to listen to it before you see anything. Like in, like it needs to be like as good as a radio play, like one of those old timey radio plays. And if it is, then you know you got a good show on your hands. Then you start building the visuals after that. Um, and so that's kind of the workflow that I've that I've uh, kind of grooved into. And and the nice thing about getting your audio first is that it can drive all your animation timing, and you're not trying to figure out all this stuff and having to go back and, and edit if something doesn't sound and look right. Uh, I love using audio as the backbone of a production. Ron, I still refer to the uh, materials in the oh, workshop, your workshop, what I just said, yes, right yes. I mean, I've added a lot of stuff to the notebook myself just for my own personal reference, but it's within reach. I did not have to leave the desk to, to pick this up. It, it's always within reach. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Just a real quick plug, in case you didn't notice in some of uh, Ron's photos, he also oh has unbelievably cool cigar box guitars, and they are a blast. There you go, John. <laughs> so you don't have to be great to have fun, and believe me, these things are a blast. So check those out. Oh, yeah, and, and just a, a note on that as we wrap up, um, I've got a, I, I had until yesterday, a cigar box guitar fundraiser. Uh, I, I was calling it a box banjo fundraiser because I because I need to use plain boxes, not cigar boxes for students. Uh, but we have raised all the money we need to uh, to provide a whole bunch of uh, box banjo kits to my students, and I couldn't be more excited. My uh, uh, bosses, when I started the job, my bosses said, "Focus on engagement, focus on relationships with students. That's the most important thing you can do." And so I would just go to school. I'd have a, I'd often have a cigar box with me, a guitar. And I'd go and eat lunch with the students. I'd, and one of the things I would do, it, just to demonstrate trust in these kids that don't see adults demonstrating trust in them very often, is I'd say, hey, can I sit with you guys for lunch? I'd plunk my guitar down. I'd, go, I'd leave it there. I'd go get my lunch. And I'm not worried about it. If they mess with it or break it, I can make another one. Yeah. Uh, but to them, they know that that's like kind of one of my treasures and that I'm showing trust in them. And then I'd come back and eat lunch with them. We'd talk about whatever. And, uh, and that's kind of part of why I'm so popular at school. <laughs> well, I didn't want to hijack your presentation. Just wanted to put that out there. Great job, Ron. Thank you so much. Uh, this community is amazing. Michelle, nice work putting this together. It's been an absolute blast. <laughs>